I'm Carmine Gallo, excited to have Jim McKelvey on today and to have a conversation with him. Jim is the co-founder of Square, the digital payment system, which he co-founded with his best friend, a longtime friend, uh, Jack Dorsey, who still runs Square and Twitter. Um, and Jim was one of the co-founders, but we are here to talk about his new book, The Innovation Stack, uh, which is written by someone who I can tell has a lot of creativity and Jim does because he is also a glass blower. Uh, is that the title? Is that the category, Jim? Glass, glass blower, blower, yes. Uh, <laughs> artist, someone who makes stuff that nobody needs. <laughs> and you were into glass blowing before computer science, before your startups, right? Uh, so I started playing with computers in, in college and I started playing with glass in college and I've kept both hobbies, yeah. That, that's fascinating. We're going to talk about startups, success, uh, but also creativity and how to pitch your idea to a potential investor. Uh, because wait till you hear some of the stories that uh, that Square has, that Jim has. But Jim, I've got to tell you, when I was doing some research ahead of time, uh, after I read, read your book, I saw an article that said, uh, from glass blower to billionaire. And I thought to myself, you know, at no point in Jim's early childhood when he was fantasizing about what career he would have, would those two words probably come together? Oh, actually, either word. I wasn't expecting to be an artist and I wasn't expecting to be rich. <laughs> it's not part, of the, not part of the game plan, huh? No, I mean, and as, as a matter of fact, it, it happened sort of uh, accidentally. I mean, uh, the square's been fantastic, but it was never something that I set out as a goal. And that's why I wanna talk about the origin story, um, which is always fascinating to me, the founder story, but also why it's so important. And uh, you've told the story before, you go into it in the innovation stack, of course, but let's talk about that story. Maybe you can relay it for people. Uh, you, you had a glass blowing studio in St. Louis at the time, and you ran into a problem a problem that you eventually found a solution for, which became Square. Can you walk us through that founder story? And then I'd like to discuss how you used it in your initial pitches and why it was so important. So it was interesting. Jack Dorsey and I had been friends uh, for years, and he and I started working together back when he was 15 and I was, I guess, 26. And uh, we had already decided to start a new company together. So this was back in 2009, 2000, late 2008, 2009. And Jack and I were going to go back into business together because he was uh, uh, he fresh out of Twitter for the first time. And I was planning to do whatever Jack wanted to do. And he was planning to do what I wanted to do. Uh, neither one of us had an idea. So we ended up uh, brainstorming for a couple of days, uh, came up with basically nothing. Um, but we had already hired our first programmer. So he was going to start soon. And we had to get going. So I went back to St. Louis to pack up my stuff. And I was in my studio trying to sell a piece of glass to a lady who only had an American Express card. I couldn't take an Amex card at the time. So I lost that sale. And it was a phone order. And I was talking to her over my iPhone. And I looked at this device in my hands. And I was like, how come this thing couldn't process a credit card? Because my attitude towards this technology is it turns into whatever I want it to. I mean, it turns into a map or a book or a TV or a, you know, gambling device, uh, you know, slot machine, um, it wouldn't turn into a credit card reader. And so I called Jack on that device. I turned it into a phone and called up my buddy and said, hey, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to build something so I never lose another sale. And Jack liked the idea. And we looked into the world of payments and realized that there'd been basically no innovation in the payments world since PayPal, which would, you know, have been a decade earlier. So we said, wow, Nobody's doing anything in this space. We should go. Why is that founder's story, why do you think that's so compelling? And, and why is it that you used it in your original pitches? And again, I'm focused on storytelling here. That I write a lot about this, and I, don't, I think it's an underappreciated element of especially young or aspiring entrepreneurs. Why is that founder's story so important, and why do you think it, it was compelling in the investor pitches? Well, the first reason it was compelling was that it was absolutely honest. I mean, there's no embellishment to that. We didn't, we didn't spin it. We didn't, you know, create some backstory later. Um, uh, but it also gave us a very clear idea of what had to be done. 
because I, as a small business person, wanted a product that didn't exist. So it was very easy, you know, being the co-founder to tell the team what I wanted. And so as we were working on the early prototypes and as I was building the hardware uh, and Jack was working on the software, um, it was very easy for them to turn to me and say, would, how would you use this? How would this work? Would you ever do this? Would you read this contract? You know, so, so it was never a case of we had to, you know, create this, you know, theoretically abstract offering. Uh, we knew exactly what we wanted because it was what I wanted. Now that very quickly expanded as we started getting other customers, sure. but to have that clarity of vision at the beginning was very helpful and it helped our pitch. And that's why it was very, you're right. It was very clear now that I think about it because the original pitch was uh, an idea or a startup that empowered small merchants to accept credit card payments over the phone. It was clear and transparent and precise. Um, now I understand it. it. It comes back to the original vision that came out of your story. Yeah, but you said over the phone, and it wasn't just over the phone. We actually concentrated in in-person payments. Oh, you said, it turns okay, I thought out, it was mobile phones from the beginning. Well, it was using mobile phones, but we yeah. also then created this device, which is a little square reader sure. that plugs into the audio jack of the phone and turns your phone into a credit card machine. So that yeah. was the sort of core innovation. And yeah. since that time, Square has been primarily focused on in-person and you know, not online uh, commerce, although we do have a big online commerce now. Um, but our original focus was was just physical. I remember seeing those for the first time. I think it was you know just uh, the, at retail stores and thinking, gosh, that seems like a simple idea. Was it a building a unbeatable business one crazy idea at a time? Was it that it was that crazy an idea back then? Uh, yes, and you know the reason I use crazy in the title of my book is because I wanted to capture the sort of negative connotations that you will experience if you do something that hasn't been done before. So, so the innovation stack, just to be clear to your listeners, yes. is not a memoir. I mean, it's not the story of Square. Square's a case study for something that I think is much more powerful, which is this idea of doing things that haven't been done before. And if you look at the totality of what you do in your life, like almost everything, I'm looking at the office that I'm sitting in and like literally everything in this room is a copy of something else. I mean, Absolutely. I've got a desk made out of wood and, and there's nothing original about this wood. I mean, this wood was descended from, you know, millions of years of evolution in, in trees. Um, I'm at 11, an evolutionary descendant of my parents and grandparents and so on. Um, and almost every idea that I encounter on a daily basis has some predecessor. Most of our lives are spent copying other good ideas, but there is this small subset of times when we have the opportunity to do something that is truly different, truly original. And when we start to do that, it feels crazy. And our, our friends will tell us we're crazy. And our parents will say, oh, Jimmy, you shouldn't do that. Or Carmine, get, get, what the hell are you thinking? You know, and, and that word crazy is in the title for a very good reason, because if you do any of the things that I discuss in the book, people will call you crazy. When you were originally presenting this idea for, for venture funding, it must have seemed crazy or certainly out there. And then you did something very interesting in the investor pitch. And tell me if this is true. I believe this is true. You had a slide in the investor pitch in which you said, these are 140 reasons why this idea will fail. Yes. Explain that, Jim. Oh, it was, it, it, it changed the tenor of the meeting. Um, if you think about most uh, VC pitches, they're these terrible sort of attack and defend uh, spectacles where the, the entrepreneurs are on attack and they're basically lying uh, to get the investors' money. And the, vec the investors are defending. They're trying to not be taken in by these lies. So they're trying to punch holes in the entrepreneurs' uh, pitches. And it's very adversarial and it's um, just terrible. And Jack and I didn't want any part of that. So we decided to be very candid with all of the things that we could possibly see uh, being wrong. And since Jack had a special affinity to the number 140, for reasons that you might be able to guess, um, we picked 140 as our target number. And we actually, I, I guess, legitimately came up with maybe 105. 
Um, and the last 35 were stuff like robot uprising and stuff. But we actually made a, made a slide that listed everything that we thought could possibly hurt us. And it was a week long exercise for the company and everybody at the company was, was nominating things that could go wrong. And then we discussed these openly in the pitch and it was absolutely transformative to the way the pitch unfolded because as we would discuss these problems, uh, the venture capitalists would tell us how they could help us. So actually one of the, one of the things that we described was being attacked by Amazon. And one of the VCs, uh, this was at Kleiner Perkins, um, said, oh, well, I'm on the board of Amazon. If you take Kleiner Perkins money, uh, I can help you with that problem. Like, we'll, we'll prevent Amazon from, uh, from attacking you, um, which actually they ultimately did. Um, but, you know, he, he, this guy was offering to help us, you know. And so it, it, it all of a sudden created this different mood in the room where the VCs were now our partners, and it really helped. Jim, there is a sentence in your book, again, going back to the original investor pitch for Square, where you say, by the time we got through 140 reasons, the investors were ready to be led anywhere. We led them to a crime scene in the ancient Egyptian town of Giza. Okay. <laughs> again, explain, because this sounds like one of the most creative and unusual pitch decks that most of those investors had ever seen. What happened? Heard, Tell me more about the crime scene. We heard from many investors that it was the best pitch they'd ever heard. Um, and and it, it had at multiple times that it was uh, the most informative, the most entertaining, and the most effective pitch that they'd ever heard. And um, the crime scene in the town of Giza, so Giza is where the great pyramids are. Mm -hmm. And we had a pyramid slide in our pitch, but it wasn't a pyramid of uh, physical pyramids. It was, it, was, it was a picture of the pyramid of uh, the credit card market. And at the top of the pyramid were companies like Walmart that did a billion dollars. And down at the bottom were little merchants who would accept credit cards, but typically did less than $100,000 a year. And we analyzed that pyramid and showed how the vast majority of profit was made from the smallest companies. Yeah, that's, that's the one. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a shocking number because if you look at the profit made from a transaction, a small merchant pays 45 times as much money. I did not say 425. I said 45 times as much money as a large company like Walmart. And we thought that was just unconscionable. So the crime that we were pointing out was the fact that uh, these big billion dollar retailers weren't paying their fair share and the small guy was paying everything. Jim, it would seem to me that the way you presented the, that original pitch deck obviously attracted funding, got a lot of interest. Do you think that some of that unusual way of presenting maybe tied back to the fact that you are an artist and that you were looking, and both you and Jack, were looking at the problem and also how to present the problem in a very, through a very different lens. It's, it's possible that that influenced how we projected, but there, there are two other things that were very, very important. One is uh, I still own to this day a company that does a lot of conference work. So I've been to literally hundreds of conferences, sat through, many hundred presentations and they suck. It's just boring and terrible. They're almost as bad as business books uh, in their sort of uh, catatonic factor. And I was not going to make a boring presentation. So when I, whenever I have to give a presentation, I take it very, very seriously. And Jack does the same thing. So when Jack was originally pitching Twitter um, to the people at the Allen Company conference, he spent uh, you know all night working on literally a 15 minute talk. Um, so Jack and I are both fanatics about the way we present information. And you have to be extremely respectful of your audience because they are going to get bored very, very fast. So, I mean, I, you and I were talking before we started recording today, uh, the fact that I've rewritten the book that you now hold in your hands eight times. Hmm. That wasn't the first two drafts weren't good, but they weren't as good as the seventh and eighth draft. You just have to refine, refine, refine. And so, one of the things that I think really helped us in our pitch was that we turned it into 
basically a show where the first thing we did was we got their attention. And uh, we did that in a pretty spectacular way. I whipped out a piece of hardware, Jack plugged it into his iPhone. I asked for your credit card and then I took your money. So the beginning of our pitch was you give me your money. And then that led to the question of which everyone asks is, oh, is that real? And the answer was yes. I just took 20 bucks from you or in some cases 40. Actually, we varied the amount of money based on how much um, we liked the VC in question. So uh, you can go back to your credit card statements if you were one of, in one of our pitches and find out if we liked you or hated you uh, based on how much money we took. But from $1 to $40, there was some payment that you made to us. So now, now we've got your attention. And, and, and with that attention, you don't want to squander it. So you want to start, first of all, uh, interesting people. And then you want to be honest. And the 140, slide, uh, the 140 reasons were a fail slide was, was very honest. Um, and then ultimately, we ended up um, with a vision of what we thought the world could be that was mostly honest, but in some ways, sort of deceptive. I wrote the first book on how Steve Jobs gave presentations. It was called The Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs. Uh, and I've and read did, that. They, it's a great book. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You did. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it helped you with the square pitch. Maybe I've, I forgot when it came, let's see, 2005. Maybe you read it before the square pitch. I don't know. It, 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 was, it was part of the um, uh, things that any good person would do to prepare to make a, um, to, to, to make a presentation. Look, if you're, if you're going to take somebody's time with any piece of content, I don't care if it's a book, it's a magazine, it's an in-person presentation, it's a PowerPoint, doesn't matter. You owe it to yourself to edit to take all the crap out of it, as you are going to do to, probably to this sense. You're probably going to edit out this very sentence that I'm saying right now because, you know, we're going to record this and then you're going to go back because you're a professional. You're going to take, you know, an hour conversation with me. You're going to turn it into 15 minutes or maybe five minutes or maybe no minutes, you know, but like the point is you better, you better be very, very respectful of your audience's attention because it is precious and you don't squander it. Well, Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated by, by this whole uh, conversation to be honest with you. I'm so glad you read Presentation Secrets too. Uh, maybe I should have been looking at Square too because I, I had no idea that, uh, that, that, pro that digital processing, digital payments processing could be that interesting in terms of a presentation. The fact that you made it come alive and not boring is fascinating to me. Uh, it, it, but I think it really does speak to a lot of young entrepreneurs I, I meet or aspiring entrepreneurs, people starting out in their career, they don't quite understand the importance, the critical role of effective communication, storytelling, and how to pitch an idea that is ultimately memorable and powerful. Well, I think they overestimate how important their idea is to somebody who's listening. Um, if you don't begin every breath with this acknowledgement that the person you're speaking to has a bunch of other alternatives, um, you're going to waste time. You're going to lose, you squander that couple seconds of attention. I believe in a course of an hour pitch, I may have investors that are listening for a minute, two at the most. And I craft my pitches and my speeches and my books and everything I do around moments of attention. As a matter of fact, Square itself was crafted around a moment of attention because if you notice, like the original Square Reader, which I designed, it's too small to read a credit card perfectly. Like this thing is so small that when you put a credit card through it, the credit card wobbles. And the reason, to, the reason I didn't, well, I mean, I actually made one that was wider and it didn't wobble and read the credit cards perfectly, but it turns out that this little device with the wobble got people's attention better, better than the big device, which worked better. And so people don't realize how fleeting and precious a moment of true attention is. Um, at Square, I made the decision to essentially sacrifice usability of the hardware that I was building in exchange for people saying, what the hell just happened? What, show me that again. Wow, look at that. Because they'd never seen a device this small read a credit card. It got us that precious moment of attention. And, and then we, we might have had three or four seconds when people were paying attention to Square. So what did we do? Well, we told them the name, Square. We told them that it was free. And we told them, you can leave anytime. Basically, no commitment, no cost. Try us out. Here's our name. And that was it. Boom. 
commercial over. Yeah, you have to have tremendous respect for the ephemerality of a person's attention. Well, I'm going to go back then to something I, I mentioned a few minutes ago. And now I had a theory. Now I think it's been confirmed. Uh, you are looking at the communication of a product and an idea very differently than the average, certainly average computer scientist um, and probably the average entrepreneur. And I'll bet it's because of that artistic background that you're bringing. You sound more artistic than just a functional delivering a presentation. Uh, <laughs> so I, I just I just appreciate that because I, I think it's. I, I mean, I don't know. A good that, presentation has to be creative. It is an yes, creative endeavor. Yes, respect the other person's time. Entertain if you can. Inform if you must. Um, get to the point and then shut up. I'll shut up then on that particular topic. No, I love that. that. That's great, Jim. Hey, Jim, the innovation stack, this whole idea of cascading, interlocking solutions that create a massive advantage. Um, is it just the product solutions or is it the way you think about the solutions? That, that is what you mean by the cascading effect of, it, of the innovation stack. So it's, it's, it's essentially a reaction to a decision to be original. So as I mentioned, we had that slide with 140 reasons on it. And one of the reasons was Amazon attacks us. And when Amazon attacks us, um, we die like every other startup that Amazon attacks. Because up until 2014, when Amazon copied a startup, uh, that startup died. And the terrifying thing that happened to Square was one of our 140 reasons came true. And Amazon was uh, gunning for us. And the thing that protected us, because Amazon eventually gave up, and I couldn't explain what happened. So I went on this two-year research quest trying to figure out the answer. And it turns out there's this thing that I had to coin the term for called innovation stack. And maybe it's a terrible term, but the, but the concept is very powerful. And that is that major breakthroughs are never just one thing. So if you think about the airplane, that's not one, you know, it wasn't like the Wright brothers invented the airplane. What the Wright brothers did was they glommed together 15 to 40 different innovations, depending on how you want to subdivide them from, you know, the propeller shape to the way they steered to the way uh, they built a, an aluminum engine uh, to a bunch of other stuff that collectively made mankind fly, fly for the first time. But people tend to oversimplify and over um, uh, embellish the, the process of innovation. Innovation is really messy. Uh, it's really scary. It's something you probably shouldn't do unless you have to. But if you have to do it, you're gonna be uncomfortable and people are gonna call you crazy. So I wanted readers to be, be able, when they come to that point in their life where they, they have a chance to do something new. You're not gonna have very many, these chances in your life, by the way, you're, you're going to have, you know, dozens, not millions. But when you see in your life something that you think should be changed and you realize that nobody else is going to do it if it's not going to be you, most people at that point will quit. But I, I didn't want everybody to quit for the reasons that I often quit, which is that you get scared, you get intimidated, you think, well, I should, I should wait until I'm an expert. I shouldn't do this. Um, and I wrote the book for a very specific person. I had a person in mind when I was writing the whole book because she's incredibly talented. Um, but every time she comes across a problem where she's not qualified, where she doesn't feel qualified to, to solve, she, she stops and she says, well, I can't do this. And my point to her is, look, the first time in human history that anything is accomplished, it is accomplished by somebody who is not qualified. You know, right, the Wright brothers, they flew the first airplane. Were they, were they qualified pilots? Hell no. You couldn't be a qualified pilot because no human had ever flown. So the first time in human history anything is accomplished, it's done by something that who, it's, it's done by someone who is by definition unqualified to do it. And yet, there they are. Wow. Innovation stack. Jim, thank you so much. What a wonderful book. It'll have a permanent place on my bookshelf. <laughs> Thank you. What a pleasure. And thank you for such a great book. I, 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 I do recall reading it uh, 
sometime in it was it would be early 2009 yeah, yeah. presentation secrets of steve jobs uh, i believe i remember that, it yeah jim to, to this day i still believe he had the whole package probably one of the best business storytellers of our time storytelling is so important but that that's by the way uh, if your readers would like or if your listeners would like they can get a free copy of the graphic novel version of my book on uh, at jimmckelvey.com so my book was originally just a a cartoon um, and if you want to set a set of buying a book, they can get a free copy of chapter nine on the birth of banking at jimmckelvey.com. But yes, tell stories and, and have fun. Thank you so much, Jim. What, what a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. This is great. Carmen, thanks. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that interview. We learned so much about effective communication skills, storytelling, and how to pitch an idea. Please be sure to like the video, leave a comment, and subscribe to Carmine Gallo TV. I'll see you next time. New videos every week.